Hi everyone, this is Brett Simon. Um, so, as many of you will know by now, the uh, Visa Bulletin was published this morning and has made most regions current. Um, so I wanted to answer some questions. I'm getting a lot of questions at the moment on my blog and in email, etc. Um, about what this means uh, and what will happen next with regard to the ban, uh, the recent ban, etc. and processing and 2NLs, many, many questions. So. Uh, so let me go through some of those questions for you and do kind of a question and answer, answer session. Um, okay, so first of all, what does, uh, what does it mean by a region being made current? When a region's made current, it means that the case numbers, all the case numbers within the region uh, can be interviewed, right? There is no more sort of cutoff number that says you can only be interviewed if you're below this number. Um, basically every case number in the region can be interviewed with the exception of country exceptions and we see two of those right now in the visa bulletin for Egypt and Nepal. So those two countries are, um, are still restricted uh, and your case can only be interviewed if your uh, case number is below those country restriction numbers. Okay, so and it's based on the country you're charged to, not the country you're being interviewed in. So if, for example, you're chargeable to some country in Africa, but you happen to be in Cairo and therefore interviewing at the Egypt uh, embassy, your case number is controlled by the fact that you're chargeable to your home country, not by uh, the Egypt cutoff. But if you're uh, from Egypt, if you're charging to Egypt, uh, or you're charging to Nepal, your case number has to be below those, um, those cutoffs. Now, will they change those numbers in the coming months uh, in other visa bulletins? I don't know uh, for sure. Um, I think they probably will um, because the numeric limits that uh, are normally imposed, such as 7% of, um, of the overall visas issued, um, should not impact uh, the uh, those two countries. There is there is some confusion in the way that the law is written about whether the 7% is taken as a cap related to the global allocation, the 55,000 visas, or whether it's taken on how many visas are issued. Um, but frankly, um, you know, we sh we're certainly not going to see the global uh, cap reached. Um, so it, it should be that there is space to uh, to increase the numbers for Nepal and Egypt in later um, later bulletins. The reasons they will have been capped, by the way, is because that uh, Egypt and Nepal are both uh, extremely busy. Uh, they've got very high numbers of selectees for those two countries. And in general, their, um, their selectees are concentrated around those embassies. In other words, most people from Nepal are still living in Nepal and want to interview at the Kathmandu Embassy. So the capacity of that embassy, with so many selectees as Nepal has, the capacity of the embassy is, is a factor that they have to take into account. Right, does that make, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so, um, so, that's, uh, so that's, you know, that covers that. So, uh, does the case matter, uh, does the case number matter anymore? No, it doesn't really. Um, uh, if your case number is 75,000 in Africa, you're, you're current. You're the current the same as if your case number is 25,000 in Africa. It makes no difference from June onwards um, you know, which case number you have. Now there is technically a, possible that, uh, a possibility that um, a region that's made current can be regressed later. But the regression is based around uh, a nearing of the, of the caps for the region. And that should not happen because uh, there's no way in the world we're going to see all of the visas uh, issued this year. Um, currently, there's around about 12,000, I think it's 12,500 visas actually issued across the globe uh, out of the possible 55,000. So there's something like 40,000 visas left. Um, there's no way in the world they're going to issue all of those visas. Um, and indeed, even though uh, all case numbers are current, it doesn't guarantee you a, an interview, it doesn't guarantee you a visa just because you're current. You could uh, fail to get an interview for various reasons, you haven't submitted your documents etc, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, or you could have an interview and go on administrative processing, 
uh, there are reasons why you might still not get a, a visa. So you have to be, um, you have to listen when I tell you, as I've told you before, that the visa is not guaranteed until it's in your hands. You're not, you're not guaranteed a visa. You never have been, you never were. Uh, when you were told you were a selectee, your letter said very clearly that selection doesn't guarantee a visa. Okay, so that's why people are told don't go and sell your house, sell your car, uh, with the expectation that you're going to uh, get the visa. It sometimes doesn't work out, right? So uh, please be very careful until the visa is in your hand, you don't have a visa. Simple as that, right? Okay. Um, okay, let's talk about the what's likely to happen with two NLs and, uh, and, and uh, what's going on. So we, we're in an amazingly complicated um, situation at the moment and I almost fall off my chair laughing when people ask me for predictions. You've got to be out of your mind if you think that anybody can can predict, um, you know, what's going to happen in the current months. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I hazard to say I know as much about this process and program than anybody in the world. But I certainly don't know what's going to happen. I can't predict the future. And so please don't even bother wasting your time asking me to predict, um, you know, what's going to happen next. It's just impossible right so let's be adult about it and let's just be calm and let's just you know take a take a breath and set and and weigh up the possibilities but these when i give you these comments these are possibilities they're not predictions and i'm not going to give predictions because i'd be a fool to do so and i'm not a fool so um so let me let me give you some some thoughts without you sort of latching onto my every word, assuming that it's an absolute certainty, okay? So what do I think is gonna happen? Right now, most of the embassies are still closed. So we saw in, when, when the uh, visa bulletin was released for May interviews, uh, the embassies were closed around about the same time that the first batch of 2NLs went out. So some people got scheduled for May interviews. Um, we know there are two batches, one immediately after the, uh, um, the visa bulletin is released, there's a batch of two NLs that go out, and then towards the end of the month, there's a second batch. The reason for them to be in two batches is to do with the scheduling methods at the embassies. Some embassies allow electronic scheduling, some don't. Uh, some embassies probably say, please send us the, um, the two NLs in that second batch, or they prefer them in the first batch, whichever right there is a, a sort of a separation into two batches that's that's clear so the first batch of two nls went out for may interviews then embassy embassies were cl uh, closed down by order central order uh, uh, by department of state because of the pandemic right when that happened they um they didn't release the second batch of two nls at all and then uh, the interviews that were scheduled in May were then cancelled. Okay, so, and the interviews that had been scheduled already um, uh, in previous months for March and April were also cancelled at the same time. Now, if, if your case is transferred to the embassy, it's up to the embassy to cancel or reschedule your case. And the embassy may tell you to um, reschedule your case through their online systems, they all ask you, or many of the embassies ask you to fill out a, um, a profile with uh, what I describe as a courier firm, um, which is how they control the scheduling of interviews for other cases. For DV Lottery, you're given a schedule, but nevertheless, the embassy still asks you to register your profile so that they know where to send the, um, the documentation after your interview, etc. It's that profile that will enable you to book the um, rescheduled appointment in some embassies. And in fact, I have heard that some of the embassies have opened up scheduled uh, slots for the month of June. So you should be A, registered on that, uh, on that um, system. You should follow the, the embassy instructions to register on their system. And it's different by country, so I don't have an example of how you register because it varies by country. But you need to follow the embassy instructions um, uh, in order to register and if you were in, in a position where you were cancelled before you may be able to just go ahead and even now reschedule your interview for uh, June and perhaps there'll be some May, late May um, uh, appointments available 
Okay, so you should try and do that. Um, other than that, the embassies may contact people and they may schedule uh, the people that they already know about. And they will only know about the cases that KCC had sent out. So it's only where your case is marked as ready uh, on the um, on, on the uh, the SEAC system. It's only where you received a 2NL that the embassy even knows about you. Until the 2NL is sent, until the case is sent to the embassy, the embassy has no idea who you are, right? So there will be some people that will be able to reschedule their cases. That's one group of people, right? And you must do whatever you need to do to, to make sure you can be rescheduled. Um, will other cases be scheduled before you? Well, possibly. If you don't get off your ass and do something about it, yes, possibly. Um, so, you know, you need to start, start using your head and get yourself scheduled for an interview, right? Uh, this is now very much, um, you know, the KCC have made everyone current. This now has put the responsibility onto you guys to make sure that your cases are gonna get scheduled to make sure you give yourself the best chance possible. So don't sit there like, uh, you know, like a fool waiting for something to happen if you can take action and make something happen yourself, okay? Um, I'm talking to you a little tough because I want you to sit up and listen uh, and make sure that you actually are doing this, right? Okay, so um, so that's, if you were scheduled and your, your interview is canceled, you should be looking for those uh, reschedule uh, opportunities. The embassy may not be open yet um, in terms of seeing public, but there are staff at the, the embassies they're working, so they may be able to um, schedule some cases. They may say, um, we're not, we're not going to schedule any cases until they're actually open. Or they may schedule cases assuming they're going to be open in May, let's say. I don't know. It's going to vary by embassy. So you need to do some little bit of common sense thinking and apply some effort, right? Okay, then for other cases which have not received a 2NL yet, either because they were about to be sent a, a 2NL for the last VB, um, and they were they would have been scheduled in that second batch or they've just been made current and they are going to look to receive the the 2NL. Now right now based on the last VB where they stopped sending that second batch of 2NLs I suspect KCC are not going to schedule interviews without knowing for sure that the embassy is open. Okay so uh, there was an original um, sort of rough date given of early May, but it, it, that was more about foreign offices, uh, sorry, field offices in uh, the USA. The, the date for opening in each of the embassies is unclear. And it could be done centrally or it could be done, you know, at the local embassy level, I don't know. Um, and so you need to pay, a, you know, a little bit of attention to what's going on in the pandemic in your country to see how likely your embassy is to reopen. Um, bear in mind that the staff, you, you, people in your country may not think the, uh, the pandemic is a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, it's, it's going to affect all of us over the, over the next few months, one way or the other. Um, but the staff at the embassies, particularly the Americans, they know damn well uh, this is a big deal because there's 50,000 people dead in America there's um, you know, hundreds of thousands and probably millions uh, infected by the virus in America. And in the, the reality is America is no different to most other countries. It's not, the, the virus is not stronger in, um, in America than it is in other countries. If your country is not suffering with you know, large numbers of deaths, it's probably because they're either not testing or they're not reporting uh, the numbers of deaths happening, right? Uh, and the number of cases, they may not even understand what's going on. So, uh, but the staff at the embassy who are Americans, they will know. They have family and friends back in America. They're in contact with people. They know what's going on, right? So those staff are not going to want to be exposed to people who could be carrying the virus if they can avoid that. And when they do reopen the embassies, they're going to be trying to practice social distancing within the embassies, regardless of whether the government in your country uh, believe it's a problem or not, the embassy staff will want to be practicing social distancing. So if they have a, a waiting room that normally can hold 100 people, let's say, they'll probably say um, that we want less people to be sitting in our waiting room, 
right? And that they'll sort of stage people out, try and space people out. So there might be a capacity of 100 normally. And with social distancing, you might say, OK, I only want 20 or 30 people in my waiting room, right? If you're embassy staff, they may have to implement new procedures so that they can interview you from a safer distance with masks on and that sort of thing. They're going to be careful to take procedures like that. They would be unwise to do anything else. So, um, so that's likely to, to affect capacity in the embassies. On the other hand, the embassies are not dealing with uh, non-immigrant visas right now. Uh, when they open, they're probably going to prioritize towards immigrant visas, and they may prioritize towards DV lottery because those visas are time-based, whereas most other immigrant visas are not um, time-dependent. They don't have the, the fiscal year deadline that we have, right? So, um, so that's, uh, that's probably how things will go, but what will happen uh, embassy by embassy, I don't know. I, I, this is one of the things I can't predict. And I could be wrong about KCC. They could, be, they could send out two NLs in the next few hours and make me incorrect, but um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, you know. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. Um, and they may, have, they may have better insight into what the embassies are gonna be doing let's say in May and in June. They may, they may say, okay, we'll schedule the June interviews and hope that those can be, um, can be carried out, right? The other thing that's going on at the moment is, of course, the executive order. Now, um, there has been some debate about the wording of the executive order because the executive order uh, talks about the, the ban applying to entry of new immigrants. Now, I've been through this before and I've had, you know, sort of differences of opinion, should we say, on people on my blog where they're saying, oh, I disagree, I think you're wrong. Uh, I, you know, I, I say things because, not because I plucked them out of the sky, but because I've got some reason to do so, right? So um, the, the situation with it saying uh, they're stopping entry as opposed to stopping issuance of visas uh, the, the problem with issuing a visa is that the visa is given to someone and that gives them permission to enter the country. And then the airline is going to board that person, um, even if that, that person really shouldn't be allowed to, um, to go to the USA because they were issued the visa after the ban was imposed. If, if the embassies were giving visas to people and the airlines get it wrong, then when those people arrive at the USA at immigration, they have to be sent back. The airline gets fined for that, and so nobody's going to issue the visa. So whilst the ban might be worded saying that the ban is on entry, the implementation of that is going to mean that they're not going to issue the visas um, you know, during the period of the ban. So they may interview cases, and then they'll put them on AP, Administrative Processing, waiting for the ban to be lifted and hopefully the ban will be lifted around about uh around about the 22nd of, of june um so hopefully the ban is lifted and not extended and if, if that's the case then they will be able to say okay those cases that we interviewed let's say earlier in june we can now issue those cases that's what i'm hoping they'll do right but again i don't know for sure it's unpredictable it's not something i can predict there has never been a pandemic like this before in our lifetimes there's never been uh, simultaneously an executive order and you know this is uncharted territory so please you know understand i can't tell you with certainty what what will be the case but um but i think that's uh, that's likely how things will be implemented that um that they if the embassy is opened in june they'll allow the schedule of the interview and um and they will um or at least rescheduling and they will hold up the issuance of visas until that time. The same thing goes for any cases that are already on administrative processing. Those cases won't be issued visas during this time of the ban. Um, they'll simply hold back on those visas, right? So I hope that's clear. Um, okay. I've had a number of people kind of frustratingly <laughs> Uh, um, and again, uh, you know, I, you're probably not used to me talking to you so straight, but you have to understand I'm working seven days a week at the moment. I'm working very, very long hours. I'm, I'm in the payroll business. Uh, we pay over 300,000 people, many of whom are um, receiving help by the government. Um, 
there's many unemployment, etc. You know, so my particular business, the business I'm in, I'm I'm a, um, a data. Um, uh, I'm in IT basically. I'm an architect in payroll systems, um, and you know, so people are looking at looking to me for solutions, fast cross, fast solutions to solve some of the problems that are um, that are happening because of the payroll disaster in in the USA at the moment. So I'm working extreme hours and honestly I'm, I, I don't have patience for people that um, that can't be bothered to read an article so under an article where I've made very clear what the ban means and if you're holding a visa you know I made very clear in the article uh, if you're holding a visa you can enter the USA I've had numerous people ask me I'm holding a visa can I enter the USA come on <laughs> read the article um, you know please help me out I'm busy um, but but let me just clarify one more time. If you were if you had already sat your interview before the ban, and you were issued uh, um, a DV lottery uh, DV immigrant visa, which is the visa that is stamped into your into your um, uh, passport, that is still valid for entry. You can enter the USA. That was specifically called out in the executive order. It was made clear. You can also enter if you're a, um, a green card holder already or a lawful permanent resident. Um, but if you've got that, you are not affected by the, tra by the executive order ban on immigration. You may be affected by um, country, uh, country bans for travel. That's a possibility, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you hold the visa, you can enter and, and become a lawful permanent resident. You can also extend the validity of that visa if um, if you're not able to travel because there's no planes flying, there's no travel options for you, you know, because of travel restrictions. You can extend that, and I've explained that in an article uh, that I've posted on my website in a video. Um, so those things are available, but uh, I think, and it's not clear from the order, but I think it will be the case that you can't extend the visa during the period of the ban. Um, so, nor should you, because you should actually be waiting a little bit. I, I've given some people an answer about this, and I've explained this before on videos. If I were sitting there right now with a, uh, a visa that was soon to be expiring, I would either travel now if I could, but if I couldn't, and through unavoidable reasons, this is, you know, this is what the embassies refer to, unavoidable reasons I can't travel because there's uh, travel restrictions because of the pandemic, they will consider extending that visa, but you've got to pay the fees again, you've got to have the medical again, and they've got to reissue a visa. You've still got to be able to, to have that visa. So that means you can only do that before September 30th, but you should do it as late as possible, let's say in July and August and September, because you, when you redo the medical, you'll have another six months past that to enter the USA. And, um, and that means that you can enter the USA into 2021, when perhaps the economy will be recovering from this pandemic situation we've been going through. Who knows what things will be like in, 20, in 2021? I don't know. Uh, the pandemic could go, you know, could go very bad or it could get cleared up. Who knows? I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but what I do know is that now 26 million people are unemployed in this country um, because of the pandemic. Um, 26 million people. 20% of the workforce, um, you know, have been made unemployed. Um, and so new immigrant coming here right now, not a good idea. Um, you know, you need to be you, you, you need to be very clear that you probably won't get a job. Uh, you know, all of us. I mean, I, I work for a large company, and we're all working from home. Uh, nobody's working at the office. Um, nobody's going to be conducting interviews. I'm not going to. You know, if I'm looking to hire someone right now, I'm not going to bring them to my office. I'm just going to say, look, for now, we're not hiring. Um, so, you know that will be your experience more than likely and certainly if you're coming to do jobs that are in retail industry or one of the affected, affected industries there's no jobs 26 million people have been uh, made unemployed why are they going to give you a job so you know take that take that piece of advice seriously okay um, right let me talk about adjustment of status a little bit 
So right now there is a ban that affects people who are doing consular processing from abroad. If you happen to be in the USA, even if you've previously planned to leave the country and do consular processing abroad, you should seriously consider adjustment of, of status. Adjustment of status, um, you know, as long as you've, you're in a legal status in the USA and that you um, uh, and you've never been out of status, adjustment of status typically is uh, is possible to adjust from, let's say, an F1 type visa to um, to your DV lottery. Uh, you go through a process. You submit an I-485 package. It's a it's a more somewhat more complicated application procedure, um, but importantly, you don't have to leave the country, and also importantly, you're not affected by this ban, uh, um, the executive order ban. So, if you just became current in in the visa bulletin today, you can submit your I-45 485 package today, uh, as soon as today. You don't have to wait till June. Um, there's an early filing um, process that you can go through so you can already file that, uh, that process and buy yourself some time before even June. And adjustment of status typically takes a little bit longer than consular processing. Let's say it takes two to four months normally, roughly it's in that time timeline. Um, but there's plenty of time between now and the end of uh, September to adjust status if you put together a well-prepared package. Um, I'll put a link below this video of the source that I consider to be the, uh, the most uh, effective, most knowledgeable source of adjustment of status information for DV Lottery. Um, there's a person whose screen name is someone's mum. She's brilliant. I know her personally. She's a very, very smart person and knows DV Lottery related adjustment of status uh, topics inside and out. Um, so I never advise people about adjustment of status. I always refer them to to this uh, this source of information. Uh, and uh, once someone someone's mum someone's mum is helping you on your case on adjustment of status, you're good. You don't need a lawyer. You just need to listen to her very carefully and follow her advice uh, precisely. Okay, so. Um, so, you know, do that. I did that, by the way. That was how I uh, processed my case, through adjustment of status. I was on an H1 visa in the USA when I adjusted status to the green card through DV Lottery. Uh, and uh, someone's mum, or mum as I call her, uh, was helpful uh, to me then and she has helped you know, many, many hundreds of people. So uh, I'll make sure that link is in the in the description below. Please go and check that out. And on her thread, um, she she um, she answers questions within a forum. Uh, and on the first page of that uh, link, there's um, on her adjustment of status for 2020. There's a link to a spreadsheet which has full instructions of the things that you're going to have to put into the uh, adjustment of status package. Uh, you know, when you have to send off your fee, your medical, uh, all of the documents that you need, etc., including the um, more recent changes on documents. So you've got everything you need to know. Uh, it's, it's all right there. You just need to do a little bit of effort. It takes a few hours. Um, and, you know, most people, frankly, should be able to, to, uh, to handle that, as I say, without a lawyer. Lawyers in general don't know what the hell they're doing when it comes to uh, DV lottery cases. Um, there's so few DV lottery adjustment of status cases, um, they just don't, they have no exposure to it. And so, you know, lawyers typically uh, are frankly almost unhelpful uh, in this process. They slow things down more often than not um, because they don't understand. So listen to mom, don't listen to lawyers um, on DV related adjustment of status. Other adjustment of status, yeah, fine, go ahead, use a, use a lawyer, it's a smart decision, but not for DV. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's adjustment of status for you. I think that probably covers most of the topics I wanted to cover. Um, I'm getting so many questions right now, I may add to this, uh, to this video later, I may add another vid video or something to try and clarify frequently asked questions. But please do use a little bit of common sense. Um, you know, no need to keep asking me questions that I've already answered in an article. Okay, there was one more subject I wanted to address. Um, uh, 
with the fact that the the VB has made all cases current, um, it now is important to make sure that your um, your documents have been processed by KCC. Now, in the last couple of months, excuse me, I'm going to get some some coffee. In the last couple of months, um, I pasted uh, posted a, a video explaining that I spoke to the manager of KCC and he was saying to me at that time that many many cases have not submitted their documentation right and that is probably why the visa bulletin has been allowed to go current obviously it's gone current because of the pandemic but it's also gone current because based on the number of cases ready for scheduling they can't reach the um, the uh, the caps right which means that there are going to be a lot of cases where people think they have submitted their documents and perhaps they uh, they believe they even, you know, they probably got the automated reply and thought, oh great, KCC have got my documents. When in fact, perhaps KCC have not got two documents. Now, over the last few months, KCC would not, there are two departments at KCC, one who process the documents and the other who uh, schedule the interviews and answer the phone calls, etc. and gen do general processing about the cases, right? So two different departments. Those departments are not allowed to talk to each other for some reason. I don't understand why they set it up that way. But what it meant was the people that you phone, um, you can't phone the document processing team directly. You can't contact them directly, right? So you can only contact the team that will answer the phone or answer emails that handle general inquiries about the cases. So if you phone and ask, um, are your documents ready? Uh, I, you know, are you ready for scheduling? Are you satisfied? You know, you'll be asking KCC, are KCC satisfied with the documents that I've sent, right? And for some months, they've been telling people that they couldn't see the documents um, until the case was current. So now, theoretically, all cases are current. Within a few days from now, hopefully, KCC will be able to answer the question um, of whether the documents have been received and processed or not. They should be able to answer that question, right? However, um, there's bound to be some sort of chaos going on. Bearing in mind that KCC is in Kentucky and um, uh, it's part of the USA and there's pandemic there. So some of the staff won't be working and if they are working, they could be working at home. Um, so, uh, so, you know, you've got to have some patience and you've got to be careful, um, you know, that you understand, you empathize their position. On the other hand, you need to do what's necessary to get your case scheduled, right? So, within a few days from now, I suggest people start contacting KCC. If you, ha if you don't already have confirmation from them that your documents are ready and that your case is ready to be scheduled, you can contact KCC and ask them if, if, uh, if they have your documents and if you're ready, if they're satisfied with your documents. They may tell you immediately that they can see they haven't received your documents and then you need to get yourself organized to get the documents sent to them again, right? Again, I'll put a link under this video uh, on a, an article I wrote that has full instructions on how to send documents. You need to be very careful and methodical. You need to make sure that the email you sent is sent to the right email address that is that has the correct subject line, that the documents are correctly identified that you've included all the documents, right? There's a number of things you have to do. If you get any of those things wrong, you may as well not bother, right? It's as if you haven't sent the documents. So if you are supposed to send, you know, five documents and you only send four of them, they just ignore the whole thing, right? So you have to make sure that you're paying attention to and following the instructions. If you do it wrong, you will not get your green card and the responsibility for that is on you, it's not on anyone else, right? So uh, you need to read this article uh, that I've, that I've uh, written to get full instructions and you need to follow that carefully, step by step. Don't forget, every article on my, um, on my blog can be translated. There's a translation feature on my blog. So if you struggle with English, um, uh, you know, just translate that into your, um, into your uh, native language and away you go. You can try, I think there's about 
150 languages it can be translated into. There's no excuse to not understand it. So, um, so you know, please do take that seriously. So within a few days from now, uh, contact KCC and see if they're comfortable with your documents. Then follow up, right? If you don't get your 2NL, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks, maybe you'll want to follow that, follow that up, right? Once you hear that other people are receiving their 2NLs. As I say, they may not be sending 2NLs anyway because of the embassies being closed. But once they figure out, uh, you know, how they can schedule cases, you need to be checking, have they got your documents? Are you going to get your documents received? And then between now, it's April now, between April and let's say May, mid to late May, you've got a chance to send in your documents. If you leave it much past then, you're really seriously risking your case. Um, you know, so over the, over the next few weeks, this is the time period when you need to figure this out, right? And this is pretty much the last chance now. So you need to get this sorted out. Um, and hopefully you'll then get an interview in you know, July, August, September. That's going to be the best case scenario at the moment. All right. Um, okay. I hope that, I hope that covers it. Um, fingers crossed. I've covered everything. All right. The video cut off, but I think I'm, I was almost done. Um, so I'll wrap it up here uh, and hopefully this video has been helpful to you and answered some of your questions. Um, please do subscribe to my channel. It'll make sure that you're updated when I release a new video. Also go ahead and read my blog, um, check the recent articles, read the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions page. Uh, I've published a lot of information. Um, uh, you know, so it would be uh, important for you to do, you know, do some basic work. Okay, so I think that will cover it. All right, thanks. Keep well, everyone. Keep safe, keep healthy, and good luck. Bye-bye now.